markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. What's up, everyone? Thank you for being here on episode 184. A few weeks back, I mentioned to you that there was going to be an interview with Mike Mangieri. Well, this right here, this is that interview. Mangieri's a co-founder and managing partner of Seven Points Capital, a proprietary trading firm in New York, and with several smaller offices in other US cities as well as Toronto. But many of you will know this already as I've featured a few Seven Points traders on previous episodes. Although Mike occasionally trades in volatility products, his days mostly revolve around operations of the firm and overseeing the traders. Therefore, he has a slightly unique perspective on things, you know, compared to the perspective that an individual trader may have. In our conversation, we roll through many topics, some of those being the birth of a trading firm, as in how Seven Points actually came to be, a day in the life of Mike, monitoring risk both on an overall firm level and on an individual level, some thoughts around psychology and mindset, examples of general interactions that Mike has with the traders and some of the difficult conversations he has from time to time. And there's a bit in there about hiring too. Now Mike's a stand-up guy. I was very pleased to have the opportunity to speak with him and to create this episode for you. I hope you'll enjoy listening. Ladies and gents, Mike Mangieri for episode 184. Futures are down 300. And then I woke up this morning. I was like, oh, let's see where they are now. And it was, I think it was flat. Then it went down to 80 again. And then it was back to flat. And I was like, well, these new stories are becoming uh, just too stupid. Yeah. It's almost like if you didn't look at the, the overnight action, you wouldn't be... Yeah, you wouldn't know. Yeah, you'd never know. It's so <laughs> true. It's so true. You really would never know. I always feel if you go on vacation, don't don't even look. Just go on vacation. When you come back, you see where the market is then. Right. So, Mike, I guess one of the, the, the first things I'd like to get into with you is just actually talking about how you started a trading firm. I think that would be really interesting to hear about. Uh, so, I guess maybe the, the first question uh, naturally would be, uh, how did you meet Mike Katz and anyone listening to this podcast uh, is probably familiar already with who Mike Katz is. He's been on the podcast a couple of times, but uh, he's obviously uh, a partner with you and and co-founder. So how did you two link up? Um, so I think I think it goes back to two thousand or right right after the whole millennium excitement. Um, and I, I applied for a job at his firm, and it was a it was a back office and marketing job. And I was like, for, for an online firm, and this is when online trading was just getting popular in the dot-com boom and everything. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll try this and let, let's see where this leads me. And I go there and I interview with two people, the two partners of the firm at that time. And my catch was actually trading there as a trader and I was going in on a, on a totally different job line. And long story short, after like a few years, the two partners didn't get along. They didn't like each other. And they get into a fist fight in the office. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a pathetic fight because they were older guys. And um, the one partner says to me, he says, listen, this is this is probably going to be it. As you could tell, I don't know how much longer we're going to be doing this together. So it's time. If you want to start another firm, let's do this because this is a chance. And I'm recently married at that time or maybe, yeah, maybe like two years married. And my wife was pregnant at the time. And I was like, oh, man, you know, I don't know if I want to go like this whole non-salary route and start from the beginning, you know. Maybe it's time I should interview somewhere else. But I was like, okay. So I sat down with her and we discussed it. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to be a nine to five guy necessarily and have my whole life planned for me. Like I want to take risks while I'm young. And I was okay with taking risks. Um, so I was like, all right, I'll do it. So Mike was a trader slash broker at that time. Our other partner, Gary, um, put up some of the capital to start. And I did all the grunt work behind the scenes as far as dealing with Fender and the regulatory parts of getting this broker dealer approved. So fast forward to 2007. Now that firm comes to a complete end with legal battles and everything else between the two partners. And we pretty much launched overnight. We moved out of the old office into the new space and we hit the ground running. There's about maybe four or five of us. And we said, well, this is it. Here we go. <laughs> it's either going to fail spectacularly or we'll make this work. So of course, 2008, 2009, everything changes and the whole world comes crashing to a halt. So at that point where 
mostly just brokers. Then we have small hedge fund accounts, maybe some mid-sized accounts. And you just sit in there at the desk and you offer them different software and we offer different platforms for them to trade on. Someone call in with orders. And that's what we're doing. And slowly but surely, more funds are going out. And they're just getting all their redemptions in and then trading stopping and it's getting slower. And we're like, wow, this this is interesting. And while that's going on, some of the firms are calling in their orders saying, hey, could you handle this for me? I got to deal with investors. I got to deal with everything that's going on. And I said to Gary Mike at the time, I was like, maybe this is the, maybe this is the route we should go. Like, I don't want to take any more phone calls with this guy closing his account. This guy wants to pay zero commissions, which is now the norm. But back then it wasn't. And we should just really start trading our own book and, and see what we could do with this as compared to having our fate and everybody else. And we started doing that and slowly different strategies were taking place and the marketplace was much different. And, you know, Citibank was a popular trade and bank was a popular trade and everybody was able to make money just trading. So we took it one step further and said, OK, now let's try to build multiple strategies. And as we do it, try to add one more guy to the desk and try to add two more guys to the desk. Um, and then two became four, then four became eight. And that's how we really started this firm. It was just moving from the brokerage business, which everybody was in, to realizing what could happen when it stops, to then adapting to a new strategy, which would be our own, and then putting in that time and effort into making it work as a trading firm and only a trading firm and getting rid of all the customers and all the nonsense that comes with having customers. And now it's 2019 and there you go, 12 years later, we're, st- we're still in the game. Yeah, well done, well done. So was that difficult to pivot from being... Because you, most of your clients, if I understand correctly, were you weren't really dealing with retail quite so much. It was mostly uh, hedge fund orders. Yeah, so most of it was that you had your handful of retail accounts, but it was never it was never what we were good at. There were good firms back then. Um, one or two are still around that were really good at handling the retail guy, but ours were more the institutional orders, the larger size orders, the one that had to be worked over the course of a day or a spread if there was a merger arb deal. And then we would handle those. And that was a better fit for us to migrate to trading because it was real orders, real size that really needed to understand the microstructure of the market and how things are trading and, and what venue to go to as compared to like, you know, a hundred share market order. And who knows, you're going to get filled in a hundred share market order. There's not really any brains behind how to execute it. But for what we were doing, we really had to understand what we were doing. Yeah. Okay. What was some of the, once you did pivot to become more of a proprietary trading firm. What were some of the early challenges which came along with that? Well, then you had, you had mainly two exchanges then, and then you had the birth of all the additional, all the different exchanges, your birth of it, all your new um, routes and order types, uh, and then you had your dark pools and your lit pools. I think that became difficult as far as understanding how the orders are now changing and how to read the tape and how to read where volume is and, and being able to have a relationship with those other vendors on the other side, the JP Morgan, the Morgan Stanley's, the Goldman's on how to access their routes and how to get into those connections so that you could trade with them and not just be lost in the crowd. I think that was a, a big hurdle to overcome. Um, at the same time, it was also understanding risk and how to know with, you know, as you're starting out, you know, your capital is much more limited. And how to make sure you don't blow up immediately and how you, you know, how to handle that risk early on so that you live to fight another day and your down day is, is a safe day and your good days, you know, are, are great. I think those are the early hurdles that you really have to master before you're going to try to add too many people. And the firms that we've seen go out are the ones that, that confuse lots of traders with success. So we might have had 10 traders to start. And they were all good traders as compared to having 50, where maybe 20 of them are good, but the 30 knock you out of the game. So a lot of it's spent on just the social part of, the, of dealing with a trader, the mental part of each trader, and knowing your limits and how many you can manage without getting hit with a blind side that you didn't see coming. Can you go into the capital aspect of it a little bit more? Because I guess this is something I've wondered from time to time, and I'm sure some others have as well. When you start a proprietary trading firm, obviously the traders who come into that firm are trading the, the capital of the partners. Correct. And you, you know, on the surface, it probably seems like you need a, a fairly significant amount of capital uh, to, to do it properly. Um, so where did the capital come from? And again, that, that really depends on the type of traders you have. Um, 
we never catered towards, you know, the former, you know, SAC capital trader that's used to trading a book of $10 million. That, that wasn't, that wasn't going to be for us. We were more of the, the smaller size, you know, and you, you get your leverage obviously on your buying power. But we always just reinvested in the firm. So if, if you made money, then you kept that money within the firm. You took out, you know, your expenses that you need to live off of. Um, and then you kept the rest of it in the firm. And then each month, if you're successful, you, you keep building that equity up. And as you build that equity up, you could add now another trader. And if you have another good run, then you could add maybe two traders. Um, and we were lucky enough that we've, we've had a nice run and we've been smart with how we use the money. So, you know, we don't we didn't go out and buy, you know, penthouse apartments and, you know, 20,000 space of office, you know, the 20 square feet, uh, 20,000 square foot of office space for five guys. So if you, if you manage that correctly, almost like you're managing your own trader, if you manage the capital right, you can now build up your equity. Um, and there were three of us that kept on doing that and doing that and doing that. And then we were able to incre- increase our number of traders. Um, at the same time, if you're not taking home large positions, you don't have to worry about your overnight buying power. And we're never going to be taking home 10,000 shares of SPY, 20,000 shares of Google. And the traders here won't do that. You know, that would be for a different firm that has that kind of capital in there. So it depends the type of firm you're looking for. It depends the type of trader that you're going to bring in. And that's not the type we're looking for. So the firms that have that have big buying power, have a lot of money, have big bankrolls behind them. We're on a smaller side and our traders trade accordingly to how we trade and how we manage our risk. And how did you go finding traders in those early days? So on, just so I'm clear, when you did pivot to become pro, a, a proprietary trading firm, who was who was there at the time? Uh, so at that time, it was myself, um, and Gary, who since passed, my cats, and maybe one or two other brokers that then fizzled out that we then left behind and said, we're going another way. If you have a book left, take it with you. Went that way. And then for bringing in traders, we started off really on college campuses of recent graduates. Okay. And the purpose of that was because we were still feeling out ourselves of, of how to teach us and how to do it. We didn't want to bring in someone that was overly experienced. That's not going to hear our way. Um, and that goes, I think, in, in, a, in a lot of fields. If you have someone with too much experience, it's hard to reteach them a new way, especially trading smaller, trading a strategy that might change in a week or two because we're still figuring it out. So we started with one and then one became two. And then probably around 2012 or 14, you know, then we were up to maybe like 20 or 30 in the room. And that's kind of been our sweet spot of, you know, 20 to 40 traders at the most. Um, and starting the same way, you're starting young small trading experience. Now we're a bit more selective because we can be, but back then when you're, you know, when you're starting on your little hungrier, you know, you'll, you'll take more and then see who's left. While now we're probably better selective and, and better screening than we used to be. Okay. And as it stands today, how many traders are with seven points? Well, we're still at around that 30 to 40 range. I don't think there's any need for us to go much bigger. And I like to stay within that 30 range. So between 30 and 40 spread out amongst California, Florida, Toronto, the city here in New Jersey. Yeah, you've got a bunch of different locations now. It's really cool. Yeah, it's interesting how that that went out because, you know, you think New York is everything. Um, and I grew up here. Um, and Mike grew up here. The talent, there's so many firms in New York and there's so much access to so many different types of capital and different types of firms and different types of funds. And it's harder to find that guy that's going to fit your niche that we found that once you start looking outside of New York, this, this whole other world opens up where there's less players involved and you could be so much more selective and get such a bigger crop of, of resumes that I feel it's, it's, it's a nice addition that we put in there. And, and, and some of our best traders are in those spots and it really, it really took off nicely on its own. But again, you got to be selective and you got to make sure, OK, just because we have five doesn't mean we have to go to 10 offices next month or so on. I mean, it probably gives you a bit of an advantage as well, because a lot of the firms are, as you kind of pointed out there, are in New York or uh, I guess more on the future side are in Chicago, whereas you don't have these smaller offices quite so much in in other cities. No, no, it's true. I mean, it was always like your options guys are also, you know, Chicago and futures of Chicago. Um, Your Forex is always like, you know, the London guys were always on that end of the business. Um, but it also plays into the culture here. You know, we really, we're not trying to be cowboys by any means. And the people that we bring in because it's our capital, we're that much more invested in them as well. So like, we like to go to it. I mean, I'm a Met fan, unfortunately. 
So we'll go to a Mets game or we'll go out for happy hour where people still get along for the most part, you know, whether it's fantasy football, we'll do as a firm or whatever it is. We try to keep the offices all mixed together and hang out as compared to just being like a factory where it's, you know, one guy is a shop in this state, another guy's in that state and they run it. The guys come in, they leave. There's no real relationship, but I, I feel like we have a good sticking power with our guys because they kind of build relationships within the firm with each other. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's really important. I, I hope, I hope so at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's 2019 now. Uh, the firm has somewhere between 30 to 40 traders. What exactly do you do as managing partner on a day to day? Like, give me an idea of a day in the life of Mike. Oh, man. I wish I knew sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, the smartest thing that we did from the beginning was we always separated our roles. So the last four to five years, it's just been Mike and I, because our, our other partner, Gary, passed away. Um, it was always kind of a rule of where, Mike, you're going to be the trader. You trade, you do your thing during the day, and that's what you should do. I'll trade every now and then. I like to trade VIX. I like to trade volatility. But I also realized that that can't be what I do every day, because you can't have both of us trading. Because I feel like if both of us are trading, then our eyes not on the ball where it should be on everything else that goes on around the firm, whether it's regulatory, whether it's just day-to-day stuff, whether it's paying the bills. If you're both competing in that trading space and you're both trading, something slips. And then that's what I've said. That will be my side of it. I'll be the other side of it. So during the day, it's whether it's emailing, whether it's regulatory filings, whether it's just the monthly bills, whether it's the monthly focus report. Because we're FINRA registered, there's always there's always compliance going on in the background. So that's my day. I'll spend doing all that as and as well as talking to the traders. Um, and it won't be like on trade setups. It's more just like the mental side of it, you know, dealing with the drawdowns when you have them, you know, dealing with a good day, dealing with, you know, I'm just not feeling it right now. And, you know, is this for me? They run the gamut of emotions, as you know, since you do all the the podcasts with the actual traders on that side. They go through it all. And a lot of times we feel like sometimes talking to a non-trader, but that's in this space helps. So half my day could just be sitting, just doing a round robin of calls to the different guys and just seeing where they're at and what they're focusing on and getting them okay in the head. Um, and then two minutes later, it's, it's answering, you know, an email on something ridiculous or it's paying a bill to this one or it's trying to get a new route onto the software to trade with. So that's most of my day. And what about the risk aspect of it? I, I presume you probably have a dedicated risk manager there within the firm, or is that something that you take care of as well? Yeah, so I, I have that. We both have it. Mike and I both have it on our screens, and some of the other offices have it as well. But that's always up. That's on its own dedicated monitor. Um, it's color coordinated, so you know who's close to what and who's where and who's getting locked out. Um that's ongoing. And when you have, you know, 30, you get used to looking at 30. It's manageable. Once you get into big numbers, then you need, you know, additional sets of eyes and different parameters. But we keep it where it, it's easily contained and we could watch it easily without it becoming mind numbing and overwhelming. Okay. If possible, I'd like to go into this a little further because uh, normally when I speak to someone on the podcast, they are uh, an individual trader in most cases, not all. Um, but in your case, you're managing partner of a firm, you're overseeing 30 something traders. So I think you probably think about risk a little bit differently because you're not, there's obviously risk on an individual level, but also risk on a firm level. So how do you, how do you think about that and sort of control that on a firm level? Yeah, it's actually two different beasts, and I'm more than happy to go through both. Um, on a firm level, it's 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 just basically your overall number. You just basically your overall exposure in a position, your overall you know short position, long position, um, your overall buying power in a day. It's 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 easier to do it overall as a firm than it is on the individual side. Believe it or not, it's it's much easier because you're looking at the greater number of the whole thing, and I don't find that difficult. The individual side is more. It's more mental because it's more not just how that guy's doing. It's what's behind it. Is this person okay? Are they able to handle it? Are they getting better? So many more emotions and so many more thought processes go into the individual at risk exposure part of the day than the firm. I think the firm's easier. So when you're looking at, let's say, your risk terminal and you see everyone's positions and you're looking at what exposure you have, uh, are there ever situations where you feel like the firm is 
is too heavy in a particular stock or a particular sector yeah. and you need to make some adjustments there? Or, or how do you manage something like yeah, that? Yeah, no, that, that's that's a good one. Yeah, so there'll be cases where either we're too long or too short in a position and you'll feel it where you start worrying about what if there's a halt risk? You know, we're all short this piece of shit that shouldn't be where it is. Um, and every one of us, you know, we're getting as short as we possibly can. You know, we'll look for shares anywhere. Just get short, get short. And all of a sudden, oh, God, now if it's halted, this thing opens up 40 points higher, there's a problem. Um, so you're constantly watching for that. And there have been times where, you know, you'll kick people out of a position. You know, either it's, if, it's, if they're losing on a day or say they're down in the stock, say they're trading, you know, the ABC, and they're down on the stock and other people want to be shorted and it's short. What if we kick people out of the name saying, listen, you're not trading the name well. We don't need additional exposure of you being in the name. We'll toss them out of the name. Um, at the same time, we've hedged against the different positions where if we're long, then we could take the other side as a broker deal. You could be long and short. Um, so we'll purposely hedge against that position or we'll just cut it down. We'll just say, hey, this is too big. And I'll message Mike on the system and say, like, hey, Mike, you know, trade A, B, C and D. It's, it's just too big. It's a nice day. Let's not give it all back on one bad move or one tweet that comes out. And then we'll size down accordingly. And how do the traders normally react to that sort of thing? As you'd expect, if they're losing in the name, okay. If they're doing great, you know, it's the end of the world. Ah, oh, this sucks. I hate this. This is bullshit. You hear everything. Um, you know, no one ever thanks you when you made the right call and you did it good. And, you know, everybody tells you how wrong you are that it, when it works out. Um, but that's just, that's just how it goes. You know, if you don't like it, well, you know, put up the money and, you, you know, go to Fidelity and trade. I'm not stopping anybody from doing it. But if we want to trade here tomorrow, sometimes you got to make that call and say, hey, position's too big. We don't need it, you know. We're going to size it down. Yeah, risk risk comes first, right? Yeah, it does. It's it's thankless. Um, and like I said, you know, when it when they're when they're up on the name and a trade would have worked out great, and you had to size them down, you know, your public enemy number one that day. And if it saved them money, you know, no one ever tells you, "Hey, nice call." <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've been doing this a while, and and having observed uh, a lot of traders and how they manage risk, is there anything which which stands out to you for how the best traders manage their risk? Like, is there anything which you think they do slightly different to, you know, a bit of an average trader? I think that leads a different way. I think what I've noticed as of late, I feel like Twitter has, has like really screwed up a lot of traders and trading in terms of risk, in terms of strategy, really in terms of all of it. Um, if you want to talk about that, we can. Sure. We want to do that now. We want to do the, just the, the risk part. Just go for it. If it works in together. I'm good either way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it probably works in together. So yeah, feel free. Yeah. So what, what I find like, <laughs> I don't tweet that much. I, if I do every now and then, it's more of a, of a vent or it's just like a, I try to be like a, an alternate voice of reason, but there's a lot of, as you probably know, there's a, there's a lot of trading communities and there's a lot of traders, but no one's actually learning. It's more of a follow. And I always compare it to a dentist. So like, it's funny. I used to tell my wife, if we go out, tell people I'm a dentist. Don't tell them I'm a trader. Don't tell them I'm involved in trading because I don't want ask anybody asking me, what do I do? What do I think of this? Hey, what do you think of Apple? I don't fucking know. What, what I, so I always say, just tell them I'm a dentist because no one's ever going to ask me about their teeth. It's never going to come up. So I always say on Twitter, if I was following people on Twitter that talked about cavities as a dentist, and they said, boy, I filled five great cavities, but boy, I blew this guy's mouth up on the sixth day. Oh, man, I got to start from the drawing board. I'd be pretty leery and concerned. And that's what I feel a lot of traders all follow. There's this, I had a great day. I had a great day. And then I blew up. And then all that, then this whole rush of, it's all right, bro. You'll get them tomorrow. Or, hey, it's not the, it's not what happened. It's the process. Or, hey, get back in it tomorrow. So there's this lack of like, it's okay to blow up. It's just part of what happens. It's okay to fail, get back in there. And I don't really feel like that applies to if this is your career and this is what you want to do. It's not maybe the mindset you, des you, know, you necessarily really want or to be surrounded by. And I think what happens here at the firm is that if somebody blows up, it's a conversation, you know, and it's a very blunt. What the hell happened? You know, why did it happen? And I'm not okay with it. You know, and maybe you'll be locked out tomorrow. Or maybe we'll take your buying power away tomorrow or reduce it. If it's a great trade and didn't happen, fine. But we encourage that trader to have that thesis to tell us why it didn't work and what was the setup. And if it made complete sense and didn't work, that's going to happen. And that's normal. 
But if it's like, well, it didn't work and it should have done this because it always did this. And, you know, everybody's tweeting about it on Twitter and this stock, this, then there's a problem. And I feel like a lot of the resumes we get and a lot of the young traders we see are adapting to that mindset of just, I'm going to follow this room. So I'm going to short low floats. And that's all I really know how to do. And you'd be amazed at every interview is like the same exact script they come in with. I short low floats and then I wait for the pre-market high and then I use that as my judge and then I short from there to the point where we're like, okay, tell me a different strategy. And most don't have it. There'll be one strategy and that's all they could live by. But I feel like to go back to the risk part of that, of that thing that I went down, the, the environment that they put themselves in, I feel really makes a good trader risk or, or, or really just poor at risk. And if it's this, I'm going to follow the room of these traders and this is what they do. And we're all going to talk together how we lost on this trade and what happened. They're not really taking ownership of the loss. It's just, oh, it didn't work. And I feel safety because the numbers are all around me. We all lost in it together. It's okay. Well, I feel like the good trader and what we see really had a process behind that trade and really understood why they lost. And when they're up, they'll know to stop. And they'll maybe test the stock three more times after they had one nice win. They'll test small. They'll test smaller again. And they know when to stop. And there's usually an independent thought behind that trade that makes them good, good at that. As compared to the herd mentality, I feel like that is where people lose their risk and the ability to just take a loss. And that sometimes happens to the best traders as well. They just they don't want to see that red on their screen. They're having a nice day. They don't want to take it. They'll hold it until everything turns red and then blows up. When you say someone blows up at the firm, uh, normally you know, retail folks, when they hear the term blow up, will probably think their account hit zero. I presume that's probably not the case when you talk about blowing up within the firm. No, no. It would be a, a daily lock number, you know, and that could be, you know, 300 bucks to 3000 bucks, $5,000, whatever it is, but it would never be their whole boat. It, it would never come to that. We have too many stops in place and too much risk. But yeah, you're right. On the retail side, you know, when they blow up, they lost everything. And that's a scary thought. And I was listening to your podcast the other day with um, Alex. I, I'm not good at the names of everybody out there. Tiger but he, was, he was talking about, yeah, you were talking about a guy that, that wanted to now trade full time and he has a wife and, and I think three kids. And should I do this for a career? Yeah. Um, and that was frightening. That was like a frightening conversation. You know, someone that, at that point, like just testing it, willing to give it all up a salary job and that mindset to test this much, to test this career, to see if it's okay. I was like, wow, like that guy really needs someone to really sit and be honest. And hopefully isn't on Twitter following these herds of look at me sitting in front of my Ferrari or look at me with my, my laptop out in front of, you know, the Sistine Chapel, you know, I'm trading in the morning because I killed it. So I flew to Italy for a weekend asshole. That's all over the place. What would you say to someone who obviously you heard the podcast I mean, what would you say, I know we dedicated a whole episode to it, but what would you say to someone who's in that position? I would definitely tell him to stay his job. Without a doubt, I would say you need to stay your job and you could do this on the side and you could do this on the side for two or three years until you get it right. There's, it, you know, the market is going to stay here. They're not closing it tomorrow. There's no, you know, six months left for the New York Stock Exchange. And then after that trading is officially, you know, canceled as a, as a, as a viable business line. Um, so I would tell them, you know, stay there. Commissions are cheap enough. Now they're zero. You could trade and build up your performance and build up a playbook of strategies that you could put together where depending, you're not dependent on how the market is. You could adapt and trade all markets, uh, whether it's up, down, you don't care because now you have a skill set. And you could use that skill set during a day, pop up another screen if you can at his job and, you know, put a few trades out there and build up that way. And maybe after two, three years, and now he has a nice size position there of equity. And maybe if you want to, you know, take a year off, give it a shot. But you know, when it's your, when it's your lifeline and you bring kids into it and that stress of a real loss and what it's like to lose when you're working alone and when you're the sole provider, it's a, it's a scary world and it could get dark really quick. And I think you have to be mentally ready for that. And, you know, your, your Twitter friends are not going to help you pay the rent. You know, they might tell you, hey, get back in the game. It's OK, bro. Everything is going to be all right, bro. You hop in, you know, I'm with you. Me, too. They're not going to write that rent check out for you. And that that's a shitty feeling. And I think if you're going to work for yourself like like I do now and Mike's, you know, we work for ourselves at the end of the day. 
the, the up times are great. When things are working great, you feel great. Everything's great. Everything seems to work out. You know, every time you cross the street, it's a green light. It works. But when it doesn't and it gets a little harder all of a sudden, and if you're by yourself and you're not experiencing, you don't have that equity to fall back on to really carry yourself for maybe two years worth of rent. You want to wait till you do it or maybe a year's worth, whatever it is. It's going to get scary really quick and it's going to affect your trading and every trade becomes that much more intense where you can't even let your your trade play out because if you made some money you want to let it run but you can't you got to take it off because i made some money i got to keep it and then you're panicked on your losses and chances are your emotion is going to not let you close that trade out and the loss is going to get bigger and then everything spirals and it spirals fast i don't think people really understand the dark side of not making money and losing trades and what that's like versus when it's okay and you're doing this as a side gig, you know, when you have subscribers subscribing to your new service or your chat service, or whatever it is, that trader could lose money during the day because he has maybe 50 to maybe 3000 subscribers paying him on the other side. So, you know, the trading for him might be a side hustle, but for you, if this is your all in, you know, you better be ready and you better be ready for losing days because they're going to happen, but you better have the equity and the risk sense to handle that losing day and be able to stay in the game and enjoy doing it. Because if if you can, you know, and this guy in that case, you know, you got to look your wife and your kids and say, holy shit, what did I just do? <laughs> may, may not be worth it. You might want to wait three years of trading or two years of trading and build up that equity and say, okay, now I can. I put money away. I could do this. Hopefully that helps somebody out there. That is so true. And that, that mental aspect of it, it's so big. And it's something you just don't really realize until you start getting your hands dirty. No. I compare it to um, paper law versus trial law. Like, you know, you hear all these lawyers and, you know, if you ever see the movie, A Few Good Men, I've they use that it, line in, ah, yeah. oh, it's a great movie. They use that line in there, you know, by the book, you know, you could do everything a certain way and you're in classroom or the movie Back to School is another great one with Ronnie Dangerfield. You could learn how to do this in class. They could tell you how to build a business, where you start, how to put your charts together, how to put your money flow diagrams together, how to do all the stuff that you need to do. But until you're in there, and it's all happening in real time. And there's someone on the other side of you now. It's a whole other thing. You know, if you want to compare it to sports, you could sit in the batting cage and they could launch, you know, 90 mile fastballs all day over the plate with the machine. And you could hit every one of them. And all of a sudden, the guy comes out throwing, you know, 90 miles an hour and it's coming towards your head. It changes everything. It changes everything. And then it throws a curveball all of a sudden. So it's these guys that are just looking at it on paper differently than when you're really in there and you're really starting to lose or you're really, you know, this is what I'm going to do full time. It, it changes those losses become very real. Your point about how it can spiral uh, out of hand very quickly as well, I think is also worth like pointing out or just sort of emphasizing because, you know, it really can, especially when you're trading intraday and you, you normally trade with bigger positions than if you were going to, you know, hold something for a few days or a few weeks or months and it was a sort of a longer term play. If some news comes out on that stock, uh, unexpectedly or it starts ripping against you and, and you're not sharp, you're not on it and you sort of just let that go, you, you know, you can freeze up and, and. Oh, sure. Yeah. It gets ugly very quickly. It does. You know, and my cats once tweeted that he, uh, like his phone died while he was on the bus. I mean, it was like a few months back and he tweeted it out and I said, you know, I'm surprised that people didn't tweet back saying that's okay, bro. You know, it's not the time that matters. It's the place that you're at. And all these ridiculous tweets that come out there and the motivational lines that people send out there with the with the picture of, you know, DiCaprio or from Wolf of Wall Street. And they have this great quote behind it. I eat and breathe this. Just complete nonsense. That doesn't even sh like shed a, a sliver of light on what it's like for the guy that's sitting behind the screen doing this on his own with his own capital. Like, you know, when you're with a prop firm, at least there's some sense of it's not all my money. The firm's at risk too. There's a little bit of a different feel. You know, some people do trade differently when it's not their money versus firm money and would rather trade their own than firm money because they're viewed and watched differently. Um, but when it is all your loss and you start to have a drawdown or you start to lose, it affects every part of your psyche. And I, I've seen it from so many traders coming through the doors here, some still here, some that aren't here anymore, where they start to doubt everything. Where, you know, it's not just a trading that becomes a problem. Now it's a relationship. That's the next thing. You know, I, I hate my girlfriend and my girlfriend's driving me crazy and I'm losing. And on top of that, it's, you know, and I got to move soon or and my rent's too high. It, the domino effect is so much different on the downside than on the upside. Nothing really changes when you're making money. 
yeah, maybe you'll go to a different restaurant or maybe you'll go out to eat twice that week instead of once that week. And a happy thing like that, but nothing else really changes, but it's amazing. And if you probably ask a lot of people when they're losing money, everything comes into effect. It's the relationship. It's the girlfriend. It's the wife, the boyfriend, the husband, whoever it is, that's going to come into play. Their commute to work is going to come into play. The people around them are going to come into play. Everything starts to now magnify a thousand degrees. And no matter what tweet you're reading on the quote, no matter what motivational book someone tells you on how you could correct your brain during times like this, you really got to be able to get out of it yourself, but also recognize like, hey, is this what I want to do? And now going back to the risk part we're talking about, can I now handle my risk to avoid that black hole? Instead of losing 5,000, could I force myself to lose 2,000 and call it a day knowing that, okay, I didn't have a good day, but I stopped myself because I know I would have gotten out of hand. And now I'm mentally ready tomorrow to trade again without now in a panic mode or in a panic state of, I got to make this back as soon as I can. You know, I saw something floating around online recently and it was this, I think it was a study which had been done and it looked at uh, people's emotions and how they were affected by things which uh, were negatively impacting their life as opposed to positively impacting their life. And things which were negatively impacting had a much greater, uh, what's the right word here, uh, impact, if you will, on them mentally as opposed to um, positive. Like the, the, the benefit that they got from something positive happened was much smaller than- um, It's so true. You know, what, what happened to them negatively. It's true. You know, it's like it's forgotten in 30 seconds when you get some good news. It, yeah. it almost becomes expected. Hey, that's great. Moving on. And everything is magnified to the hundredth degree on the way down. But that's the, the other part of it is, is that life outside of trading. And I mean, I'm probably a little fucked up in my own way. You know, socially, I don't think I'm <laughs> the, the most normal person. But I think you got to have a life outside of trading. And I don't think that life needs to be, I'm going to hit the books 24 seven. And if I'm not hitting the books, I'm not working hard enough bullshit. And I think that's a huge stream of bullshit that comes out a lot. You have to put your time in, there's no doubt about it. I don't think anybody will question that, but you need to have a life outside of it to change it because it's that much more intense. Um, and it's real money at stake. And as much as people don't think that money really matters, no one's doing this for the fun. The money is a huge part of it. Um, and as you make more of it, it becomes more fun to do because of the upside of it, but you have to have a life outside of it and, and whatever that could be, it could be, you know, going to the park and taking a walk or, you know, playing like, you know, I'll go home and I'll play t uh, tennis twice a week, you know, or the kids will have soccer on the weekend. And the last thing I want to talk about is work. And the last thing I want to read about is, you know, fin twits on Twitter, um, or anything else. And I think you need that escape. And I talk to a lot of the guys here and I always talk to them about, you know, what's your three month plan? Um, you know, the Krishna, for example, um, and he, he's great in Florida. You know, he wants to run a marathon in November. So my conversation with him during a trading day, you know, or after the fact will always be like, did you sign up for that marathon? Are you doing it? You know, some of the guys at California skydive, you know, Stan, who's you know been with us for so long and I, he's been on your, your chat with traders. You know, I talked to him and what he's into his MMA stuff or, you know, he'll take walks on the beach or, you know, he's a single guy. So he's dating. And what could be better than dating in Fort Lauderdale? I mean, damn. Um, <laughs> so it's like you, you got to have that outside life because if it's just this, you'll burn out. And then your negatives have nothing to counteract to a positive. So, you know, you can't just take this home with you and then have it affect everything else that you do. You got to leave it there and say, okay, now I'm going to go play tennis with my friends. I'm going to go play basketball in the park. Or I'm going to take a walk with my dog, whatever it is. You got to have it. You got to balance it. And you, you can't, you can't be on social media all day after trading all day. And that's your outside. That can't be your outside. You got to unplug that thing and put it in a drawer and walk away for two hours, you know, and then come back to it. For sure. Yeah. I actually started doing CrossFit like 12 months ago and um, it's been awesome. I lasted a month. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I tried it for a month and I was like, oh, this sucks. I almost and didn't get past a month either. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm amazed at some of those people. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I don't know, it's just awesome. Like you can have a really average trading day. You know, you go do that for an hour in the evening and um, you sort of forget a lot about it, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you need to. Like, you know what? You can't, as much work as you need to do, and I'm not downplaying the work level because, I mean, we do a lot of it. Katz does a ton of it. 
you know, there's so much reading that goes on into it. And people should read plenty of good trading books out there. But you just need that, you know, whether it's an hour a day or X number of hours a week, you've you got to get out and be part of something with other people where, you know, there, there's there's conversation, whether it's with the Yankees or the Patriots or the Red Sox or whatever, whatever you're into. You, you can't live and breathe this. And as I think that's what we're saying, those those upsides, you'll have fun doing CrossFit with your friends because you're talking about just whatever it is. And it's not going to be about the market, I'm sure. And you're just having a good time. And then when you come in the next morning to trade, you're ready. You know, you don't need me to sit there at night and tell you, you know, you should be back in the book. You got to read because reading is where you get better at trading. And I'm always working. If you're not working, you're not working hard enough. I don't need this asshole telling me that. <laughs> you need to just to, to get yourself set mentally understand how your mood's affected by your drawdowns. Then you take your drawdowns and you say, where's my risk? Where's my risk so I could avoid this black hole that I'm going to go down if I don't manage it? And then what happens is as you get better, you now say, okay, there's my, there's my max loss that I could take mentally before shit starts getting a little too dark for me. And I start to panic. And now I could handle maybe three days of straight losses. I can handle a week of straight losses because each stop out that each day wasn't going to be enough to kill me actually implementing it. And that's the other part of like having a mentor or somebody near you, which I feel sometimes helps if you're at the right type of prop firm. And there's plenty out there besides seven points. It's not a commercial for seven points. If you're with the right group, you try to find people to hold you at least accountable, whether it's to question why you did it and just have to justify yourself through arguing it to see your own point and to see if your point was strong enough or to just hold you accountable to be like, hey, you know, that loss was too big. You know, you should have cut it here. You know, you should have cut it here. Why didn't you? And have that conversation. And I think that real life person, you know, in front of you, whether it's, you know, on the phone, a friend or whoever it is, you got to have that. And I think that also helps keep your your risk in check. I don't think you could do that, you know, necessarily on your own and with the same type of challenge, you know, having your self conversation on how I should have closed that trade out. I think you need someone in your life. And like I said, it could be online. Someone that you trade with that you've developed a relationship with that could hold you accountable, whether you share your journal with them or something to say, this is where I should have cut it. My loss would have been 2,500 bucks on a day instead of 5,000. And now here's why. And then by having to fess up and discuss it with that person, you start to realize how stupid it was, the mistake that you made. And then that ownership comes in. Because if you're doing it by yourself, you can you skip the ownership part. I fucked up. It's my fault. You're pissed. You're angry. That's about it. But if you if you have someone in your face, like Mike will do, Stan, Krishna, Nico, whoever it is with the traders around them, I feel like that also builds that ownership to now you don't want to do it again because you just had this conversation. You don't want to go back to the same guy again and be like, man, I did it again. Cause you just went through that whole exercise and mentally you don't want to do it. I think that also, helps, you know, and like I said, that could be at a prop shop. It could be a retail guy at home. You know, don't have that guy selling you a DVD or a fucking newsletter at the same time as trying to be a mentor. You got to have a mentor that's independent of any type of, Financial gain in your conversation. It's got to be a guy that I could say, hey, Aaron, boy, I fucked up on this trade. You know, let me walk you through it and then question me on all everything that I did. And if I can't justify it the right way, now there's where our conversation will take us. And then you can really dissect your trade and what went wrong and where that stop should be next time. But if, you know, if you're Aaron and you're saying, OK, good, you should do this. And now you should buy my next video on risk management. And it's not going to work. One question I'd like to ask you, Mike, uh, before we move off of this conversation about risk and sort of whatever else we've been talking about, sort of gone away on a bit of a tangent there, which has been great. How do you, and I don't get the chance to ask this question often because most people I speak to aren't in your position. How do you actually become comfortable with the idea that you have 30 plus people who are trading with your money? I think the key is not to get comfortable. I think by me never being 100% comfortable where your eyes are closed keeps everything real. And it, it, like I said, if, if we went from zero to 30, you know, it'd be completely different. But because it was a slow growth of just constantly moving a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, you know, add two, add three, lose one, lose two, add three, add two, it didn't become so overwhelming. Um, and you know, and the other part of it is if you, if you have a tight grip on your risk and we do with the guys here and you know, some people may not like that their, their lockouts are very low, but there's a reason why they're low. And that also helps us stay more comfortable while we're doing it. And I think you need to, to view your risk and start at a level you're comfortable with and don't go above it. And I have a wife and kids and I say to myself, you know, boy, if, if today's not looking like a good day, you got to roll it back a little bit and you got to tell some guys, hey, you got to stop. You got to look at where they are in the month. 
and say, hey, you're having a decent month. Let's not give it all back in one day. And then start having those one-on-one -on -one conversations so that you're managing not just your day loss, because you could take a loss for the day. It's, it's totally normal. Um, but you got to look where you are in the month. Now, if we're having a really bad month, as the month goes by, you size down even more. And the ones that are really struggling, you size them down even more than normal. And you have that conversation, hey, maybe you want to take Friday off. Maybe you want to take Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday off until you get your shit straight, until you get right again. And let's size you down from, say, your max position of 20,000 shares. Let's bring that all the way down to 5,000. Start getting comfortable. Maybe you'll bring it down to 1,000 shares. Just see if your setup's right before you start going live again. So you got to have a proactive plan for your down days. Your good days, you leave it alone. You know, you don't tell anybody, hey, you're the best trader ever. You know, you just, great. You had a nice day. Things worked out. Great. Let's not give it back tomorrow. So it becomes a rolling P&L of every day. It's another day, but it's also a cumulative effect of how we're doing for the month, how you're doing on the last two months, how you're doing on the last three days. And I think that will make you more comfortable on the firm level, and that will make you more comfortable on dealing with people individually as well, on knowing when they need to slow down, when they need to stop, and maybe they need to stop for a few days. And then at the worst case scenario is, hey, maybe it's just not there. You know, you're doing everything right, maybe, but it's just not there. You know, I'm going to call it here. So that's what you have to do. At what point do you consider increasing or, or decreasing a trader's buying power? Like, is it just on a case by case basis or do you have kind of almost like a set of rules which you uh, makes that decision quite systematic? Um, no, I, I would say majority is case by case, trader by trader. Um, you know, you, because it's hard to do it systematically because you might have a guy that, that's, that's trading well at the size that he's at. And then when you give him more, they can't handle it. You know, they personally, they may not be comfortable trading a bigger size. So say, you know, trader A, you know, a Brian likes to trade 5,000 shares. That's his number. He's comfortable at it. If I tell him to go 7,000 shares, it changes his whole psyche because now he's uncomfortable because he's not comfortable with that size. And however he is, he doesn't like to see that size on his screen. And then, you know, as it's ticking against him, that loss is too big for him per tick to see. Um, and it may not work for him. While another guy might be doing great at five and then he wants more buying power. Okay, great. Give me a little bit more. Let's go 6,000. Let's go 7,000 shares. See where you're at. Um, so it's really how they could handle it. And, you know, just like some hedge funds that after a certain point of capital, there's nothing really they could do with it anymore. They don't want to go any bigger in certain positions, that's for sure. And they don't want the risk anymore. So they have to be willing to, to handle the bigger risk, hungry enough to want to go bigger and push themselves. And at the same time, have the risk that we're comfortable with where they know how to kill a position. So, you know, when you have someone like a Mike or a Stan, um, a Krishna, those type of guys that have been around a while that are so methodical at this point in what they do. And, and you don't mind saying, hey, if this guy says, I want to go bigger today, you know, with Mike, it's different, obviously. If it's, you know, Stan or a Krishna that says, hey, I want to go bigger today, you know, could you bump me up? You don't really think twice. All right, let's go. Let's see what you're looking for. But there's a reason behind why they do it. You can't just blindly say, okay, you hit X, P, and L, let's go bigger. I don't feel like it ever translates. Exactly, yeah. There, like you said, there's, there's method behind it. Obviously, certain things are lining up for them, which they like to see, which lead to their best opportunities, which is you know, why they want to go a little harder on this one. Yeah, and then you know, a lot of people just like that feeling of sizing up, or I want to go bigger, I want to go bigger, but you know, it, it doesn't always equate to much and you really have to you know when, when someone tells you and that's that's popular in a space and everybody's pushing themselves to trade a little bit bigger a little bit bigger they got to be able to do it you know a little bit each day you you can't double your size tomorrow because it it, it, it just doesn't work like that and and you can't you know you can't go 50 percent all of a sudden you know you start with 10 percent. you know you start with 20 percent bigger and just see how it goes and wait wait and handle it and see if you're actually going there because sometimes what will happen you'll give the guy say I'll give you buying power so that you can now do 20,000 shares of X, Y, Z. Um, and they normally trade 10. Sometimes you'll see them never even approach the additional buying power. They're just in that comfort zone of that size and you just got to let it be. And I feel like when you start pushing the size on people and, you know, it, it, it doesn't work and it screws them up. And the ones that are ready, just give them a little piece and see how it goes. You know, it's like a little kid with ice cream. You know, can I have three scoops? All right, why don't you finish the first scoop, see how you're doing. And by the time they get through the first scoop, they're stuffed. And you know, you got two scoops sitting there on the floor melting. Um, so <laughs> it's just, it's the same thing, I, I think, with a lot of a lot of traders. And I wish more retail people took that approach, but I, I don't think many, many do. Yeah, gradual steps.
Yeah, they, they equate size of a position to size of other things. And it's always got to be, you know, look at how big I was today. Moving on from risk a little bit. And I actually made note of a comment you made earlier. Um, you spoke about, I don't remember exactly what you said, but it was along the lines of, uh, you know, when you have resumes come across your desk and you may actually get to the point of interviewing someone. And a lot of people say the same thing during the interview. That could be because the type of firm you are and the sort of people it attracts and that sort of thing. But how could someone better prepare for an interview? And this doesn't necessarily have to be specific to, to seven points, but for you know anyone who's going into an interview at a trading firm uh, for a trading role, is there anything they could do to better prepare themselves? You don't want to see, at least for seven points, I don't want to see the paper trader anymore. I don't want to see a guy that, that comes in, I'm trading for six months and it's all on paper. That's, you know, that's, that's a big one. You know, and a lot of these, a lot of traders out there are still on paper and it's great, but don't think you could apply for real money at, at any firm. Um, and I'm confident saying I would think any firm that's giving you capital is ready to allocate you capital if you haven't had the feeling of real money in the market. Um, and if you haven't ever seen that money go from $5 to $1, you know, don't show me your paper trades. Because they really, the emotion behind trading is completely void when you're paper trading. So I don't think that works. Um, and I think what really stands out are the guys that are putting the time in to having a full arsenal of strategies. You know, don't come in with the one most popular play because that popular play doesn't last long enough for you to really build off of it. And if you're not already looking to the next one, you're already behind. So I think if you come into any firm and say, okay, what do you do? And like I hear all the time, I short low floats. Okay, what makes you go into the trade though? Okay, that's great, you short low floats. Okay, great. But what makes you go into the trade? And then when you see it's like a regurgitation from the first interview to the fifth guy, to the sixth guy, to the seventh guy, you realize they're all in the same grouping of who they follow or how they follow, which is like a recent phenomenon. I really feel like it's in the last two years, it's really ballooned into this phenomenon of so many people following other traders that the thought process behind a trade is, is missing. And I think what stands out in the guy that we look for is maybe he hasn't made a dollar yet trading and he's lost money in three of his last accounts that he's funded, but he's constantly working on a new style and a new strategy on top of what he has. And I think that guy sticks out because you'll see a, the work ethic, is there that he's not complacent with just the one. And the two is that he's smart enough to realize that what's working today may not work tomorrow. And if I'm not planning for that tomorrow, then I'm going to get left behind when this trade dies out or becomes too crowded. When I used to make, say, you know, a hundred bucks on the trade, now I'm only making $10 because now it's just a crowded trade that everybody's in. I got to see what's next. And I think that's the guy that we're attracted to. Um, and he could be red. He might be red and we'll still say, okay, but there's something about this kid that sees the next step two or three in front of them to know that I should come in here with the plan and, and, and a playbook of three or four different strategies that I'm studying and working on and back testing or whatever it is as compared to just coming in as a one trick pony. Do you feel like having interviewed many people over the years that you, you've kind of found some sort of secret to identifying early talent or is it still a bit hit and miss? Well, you know, the other part that's important to point out is because we have traders in house, the other part of the whole thing is you got to find people that are going to fit in with the culture of your firm. So that's like a whole other part of the interview. So aside from the trading part, when you have people that are going to be in a room is, you know, you don't need your alpha male lunatic that might be a great trader, but coming in a room and now ruining the environment of, say, 20 other traders that are sitting there. So. Although you don't, you don't think that it's going to matter as far as like a trading firm or we have one bad apple could really ruin an entire bunch. And we've seen traders that come in here and, and Mike and I've sat and said, wow, this guy's numbers are good. He's got a good strategy. But, you know, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sit next to this guy. You know, I don't think anybody else wants to sit next to this guy. Or at the same time, they just, you know, whether they, whether they just don't want to speak, which for some degree is OK, or there's no social engagement or there's no eye contact, just weird little tip offs that you say, OK, if we're in a room where we're all discussing a trade or we're all talking about something and this one person doesn't want to engage with anybody, you know, that also affects a firm. So for, for us that, you know, that have traders in house, that has to become a part of the uh, the uh, the interview process because 
when you're feeding off of each other, especially in the smaller satellite offices, when you're feeding off each other, one bad guy really can bring a room down. And it's negative energy when someone's trading that you don't necessarily need. You know, a guy that slams his keyboard, you know, or throws his mouse across the room. Once in a while it happens, fine. Okay, it's funny. Um, but when you have a guy that's a, a constant distraction, then you have to, you know, weigh the, the pros and cons of having them in there versus his P&L. You know, sometimes a P&L will win, um, but for the most part, you know, that becomes the other part. So besides the work and the strategy and having a playbook is great, you also have to be able to be socially functioning enough to say, I could sit with other people around me and then add to the conversation or bring some some new points of view to the conversation so that everybody gets better around you as compared to, you know, a, a lunatic that's going to turn a room upside down. Right. That's a really interesting answer, actually. I um, hadn't even ah, sort hope of... hope I'm doing all right here, then. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. Uh, yeah, I hadn't even really considered that. People are going to be so bored of this podcast. They're going to say, oh, this guy's not even talking trading. I'm tuning out. <laughs> Abs- absolutely not. I think you'll be surprised. I think you'll be surprised. Now, when someone comes into the firm, let's say they're more of a junior trader, um, you know, they don't have five years experience behind them. How much involvement do you have with that trader or are they kind of left to their own devices for the most part? Like what's the firm's involvement in taking that trader from, let's just call them a junior trader to a more experienced and, and more profitable, better, uh, highly talented trader? Um, I, I'd say half and half. And, you know, I, w- I would say the other offices probably are more involved because they're smaller offices and this is than, than this main one in the city here. Um, it's a little bit of both. You know, in the beginning, it's it's screen time. You know, it's it's on a demo of just watching the screen, you know, calling out your setups, writing your setups, putting them on a demo mode just to get used to now. Now the screen's moving. You know, now a stock is actually moving and, and getting used to that environment. Um and then it's mostly about the journaling. It's conversations during the day for sure, but you can't force feed them to trade either. You can't sit there and say, you know, I'm going to mentor you and you're going to sit next to me and I'm going to tell you everything you need to do. It's a promise that you just can't really keep as a, as a, as a firm because A, the trader that's your, the mentor doesn't want to always have to do that. They need to trade as well. Um, plus, then they're not developing anything on their own. And they have to they have to be able to now take that trade and see it and then put it on. And at the end of the day, you can then review it and then everybody has journals here. You know, we use trade view and they submit them and we review them and we make notes on them. We comment on them all the time. Um, but you, you can't, you can't hold their hand the entire time and they have to eventually swim on their own. But in the beginning, you know, we'll go over routes, we'll go over destination on, you know, how do I find liquidity in this stock? Where is it printing? How do I read the tape? You know, how do I find, you know, this is moving. Why, how can I find out news on it? How can I see if there was a filing that was filed? Um, all those different things, then we'll we'll walk them through those things and spend time on it. You know, do it as a group, do it one on one. You know, do it over messenger here in the office. We'll have conversations with them where, you know, you don't have to single them out where they feel funny. You know, not knowing something that the entire room would know. So we have an internal system here that we could talk to each trader with, and you'll have a conversation over that sometimes. So I, we don't baby them. You know, maybe ten years ago we did a lot more handholding um, than we do today. But, and that also comes with now the interview process of someone that has at least some experience of putting on a trade, but it's, it's more of a guided learning and then a, a question and answer, almost like an argument we'll try to put in front of them on why did you do it and what was you thinking and why do you think it made sense? And then challenging them to answer it as you take the other side. Cause I always feel like if you challenge someone with an answer and, and you make them really present their case, they're learning at the same time by having to justify it. We'll do it that way. But it won't be 100% on your own and it's definitely not going to be, you know, we're going to hold your hand here and make you the best trader because, you know, we're going to do that and we're going to sit with you and show you everything that we've ever seen. That's just not practical. Yeah. I mean, I guess it just doesn't really work like that, does it? No. I mean, it's promised and people say it. I've heard a million, you know, a million people come here and say, I was trading at this firm and they told me I'd have a mentor and he did this. But, you know, at the end of the day, you look at that trader when they start and like, well, listen, there's not much really there to what you're doing to be mentored by. You got to... Put some time in yourself. You got to get that screen time in. Show us your trade. Put the trade and now have that conversation as compared to just sitting there saying, you know, Mike's saying to, you know, a kid that's just starting out, you know, this is why I put a trade on and why now you should do the same thing. They're never going to get good. They're not going to become a real trader. They're just going to be a follower and they'll follow for as long as they can until there's nothing to follow anymore because someone didn't show them where to put the trade on. They got to have that independent thought to put it on. And I think you train them not in real time necessarily, 
but on the after effect, on questioning the trade and why they did it and where they made a mistake and how to correct it. Or justify a good trade as well. You know, when they have a good trade, why? You know, and where did you where did you add to your position and, and, and illustrate that and show that? And I just think it really cements the learning process more. Mike, I'd like to ask you, what are some of the tougher conversations that you need to have from time to time in your role? I mean, the toughest is when you tell someone that's working hard that it's not working. You know, no one wants to to have that conversation. We've had plenty of them. You know, it's it's a high turnover business trading as a whole, whether you're trading individually at home and your account goes to zero and you move on from it, you never trade again, or to trading at a firm. And, you know, for for someone that's not really putting the time and effort in, it's it's not that hard to say, hey, it's not working. You, you know, it's not going to work here. You got to go um, because you don't feel like they're as invested in it as well. But when you have guys that, that are here early, that are putting all this time into it and get it, and, and they're good kids for the most part, you know, they outside of the office, they're a good person, in the office, they're a good person. And I think it sucks when you sometimes have to tell them like, hey, listen, you know, whether whether you're too afraid to trade, you know, you're, which is which is so common where people are afraid to put on a trade because of the risk, they're afraid to lose money, so they take trades way too early, you know, and their P&L never is going to get there because they're just taking these small, tiny little gains all the time. I think those are the hard, the hard conversations because you know they put the time in and you know they put the work in and they really want it. Those suck, you know, and then on the flip side, you know, sometimes having to tell a really good trader, you know, it's time to slow down or it's time to take a day off or, you know, I got to cut your risk is also just as hard because there's a confidence that you don't want to rattle on a good trader. The one that's just starting out that you have to let go, they don't, they're not always totally surprised because the numbers aren't there. It's, it's, they get it. You feel like shit because it's a good kid and you have to do it. But the, the harder I would say of that is when you take a good trader that's struggling um, and they're going to tell you every reason on why they're struggling and they know everything that it's not working. Those are the harder conversations because sometimes you just can't get through the layers that are with them. There's, you know, the, the confidence and the swagger that comes from doing well, but then having someone, you know, like me say to them all of a sudden, hey, I'm going to cut your risk. It's like, wait, I've been doing the well for this long. I know why the trade's not working. It's not me. It's a Trump tweet. It's not me. It's this China, China tweet. I'm getting screwed all the time. Or there's a million different reasons on why they're losing. But when you have to put them in the box to say, hey, let, let's close the risk down a little bit. Let's size down. You have to be ready for every argument to come at you and then be the bad guy and say, well, listen, I have to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. And you, you're going to hate me for it. And, you know, we can't have lunch together today now because you're pissed. Fine. Um, you know, that's the the, the hard skin you have to wear in, in my or, or Mike's position uh, of having the, the thick skin to say, all right, listen, they're going to call me every name on the Sunday. They hate me now. OK, I can get over that in two minutes. But I got to do what's best for that trader right now. And he's never going to recognize it. And that's the hard conversation to have because they're not going to want to. And they're going to fight you on it. But you have to, at the end of the day, do what's right, not just for you, but for them as a firm, I mean, for your firm, but for them as a trader as well. Because if you see that it's tilting and they're going to start to now tilt bigger, you have to be able to stop it for them because they won't. And it's a shitty conversation, but you got to have it. How do you decide when to let someone go? Yeah, it, one could be purely p and you know, where they, they just can't, they just cannot make money. They cannot get the right possible trade. That's, you know, that's the, the honest one guy that's not going to make it is because he just loses. You know, he's not losing from, you know, a great run and he had a slow streak. This is just the constant losing trader. He's going to have to go just because, you know, money doesn't come from nowhere. You know, we, we're not Goldman Sachs. You know, it's, it's different. So that's your first guy that will go. Your second guy that might go would be a good trader that, that fails to adapt to a changing market. Um, and what worked last year that's not working this year and you're still clinging to it and now you're taking losses every day, but you're not changing. That's another conversation where you say, you know what, either you're going to change your process and adapt, or you're going to keep doing the same shit that's not working day after day because it worked last year. Great. And you had a great year and you made a lot of money and you know, wonderful, but it's not working now. And if you can't adjust it, then that's a conversation where a guy might have to go. And then there's a third one, which is purely a cultural thing within the office where you have one guy that's just disruptive, you know, and, and just a pain in the ass in the room and it's affecting everybody else around him, then that's the third guy that would go. But two being the hardest, I, I would think a losing trader knows it's coming or there's no real shock. The hard part is when you have a trader that's not adapting to what's going on and has a million reasons why and a million excuses and a million new rules every day. I got a new rule coming out. I'm not going to do this. 
you know, unless you see the changes actually happening and you say, okay, I believe in you and you, you're going to do it, you could stay. And then there's the one that's going to, you know, just not do it and constantly, constantly wait for a trade that doesn't exist anymore and just take losses every day. And then that guy will have to go. How often do you find that traders leave on their own will? So I just asked you before, how often do you have to let someone go? Um, or how do you decide when to let someone go? Are there just as many cases when people leave on their own will because they uh, realize themselves that maybe they're not cut out for this or, uh, you know, the numbers just don't back this up? Yeah, I, I think it's actually who gets to who first. I think for the exact same reasons I told you, they'll let them go. Or a lot of times the same reason why sometimes they'll call it a day also. So like, you know, they'll be used to making money and all of a sudden can't and realize, well, this isn't working. I can't trade in this market. You know, this isn't for me anymore. I need to now change and do something else. That's one guy that will leave. And then the guy that's losing, you know, it, it, it's especially when, you know, you're a young person, this is your sole source of income. You know, at some point you got to say, hey, it's, it's not working. I, I got to get a nine to five job. You know, I got to I got to still pay bills. I still got to make a living. Um, so in some cases, it's of who gets to who first. Are we going to get rid of them first? Or are they going to get rid of us first? Yeah. OK, well, let's end this on a slightly more positive note. Your position, uh, managing partner of the firm, I presume one of the things you're constantly looking out for, and I might be, might be slightly off here, but uh, is sort of potential avenues of growth and how you can continue to evolve the firm and that sort of thing. How do you think about that part of it? And, and you know, where do you look? What sort of opportunities do you, do you think to seek out? Do you, are you looking at like new things or are you trying to double down on your strengths or... Uh, yeah, I'd yeah, be interested no, to hear a, about that. That's a conversation that, you know, Mike and I, uh, Mike and I will have often. You know, we really, you know, you, you don't want to just be, as I always saw the trade, don't be a one-trick pony. And as, as a firm, you don't really want to just do one thing. You know, we're presented with a lot of opportunities all the time. And, and, and people reach out to us and say, hey, you should start a newsletter. Or, hey, you should start a chat room. And, you know, it, that's not an avenue that we want to go down. I, I don't feel like that's going to add value. So for us, it's... It's either trying to find like a, a new avenue as far as maybe trading or trading strategies. That's always a conversation or just really trying to find like what what we've learned and, you know, we'll be able to build how we could then put that to a, a greater scale. You know, whether it's maybe we'll write a book, maybe we'll write a book together, um, something like that, you know, maybe doing other things with other firms. You know, we've thought of a few times where. You know, there might be a really big firm in options and we're a big firm on the equity side. Maybe there's something to do together at points where we feed off each other's, you know, insight and strengths in that capacity. So the good part is that we're small. It's, it's just Mike and I so that we're adapted to where if somebody said, hey, you know, we want to have a conversation with your firm, whether it's doing something together or strategically, you know, maybe someone knocks on the door and says, hey, we'll buy you guys out. We'll always have that conversation. Um, or whether it's, you know, say, Hey, have you ever thought about, you know, trading this entirely different market and we'll show you, you know, the ins and outs of it. Um, we're open to all of those because we can be, so we don't have to go through a lot of layers of, of, of management to finally have a conversation with somebody. And as these conversations come up and people approach us, there's really nothing that will turn down as far as listening to somebody's idea. So I'd like to, I'd like to think there's, there's more coming down the road, um, for seven points and whether it's asset classes or, you know, strategic, you know, partners, uh, yeah, I think it would be great. There was one other thing, uh, that I thought would be, would be good to ask you about. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but looking in, it, it kind of seems as though the majority of proprietary trading firms nowadays, uh, are not, are not the traditional prop trading model. Most people are, are trading in teams um, that are heavily driven by technology and the, the firms where there's individual traders trading their own accounts, uh, the majority of it's discretionary, those kind of firms seem to be less and less. And that's, uh, I think, how I'd describe Seven Points as being one of those firms. Like, how do you feel about those types of firms becoming less and less popular? Um, well, I think because, you know, when I started in the business as a whole, there was, there were a million online trading firms They were popping up overnight. It was like a million different firms. You know, there were like three basic platforms out there to trade on and, and real tick at that time was probably the most popular. So you had a million firms with a million branches, all offering the same software out there to traders. Um, and then as you know, during the recession and the dot-com bust, a lot of those firms disappeared. 
Um, and then a few stayed and a few really did well and just captured more and more market share. Um, so I don't, I, I do agree with you that it's, it's not a most popular breed anymore. And a lot of firms are going more towards just purely the quant side. Traders are trading their own money and, and, and different you know, aspects, but we are one of the few that are left. And I think with that comes responsibility on doing it right. And I think because we're not looking for the mass of traders, we don't need to be a hundred to satisfy our own ego of traders in the room. I think if you really invest in them, and you really build it with the right culture around them and the right goal in mind, you can still do really well and have a, a successful firm. Um, I think it's when you take your eye off the ball and start thinking like, I'm just not going to follow this next herd of, of quant trading only. And you go into waters that you're not as familiar with or not as comfortable in that's where it could go wrong. So I think as long as we stay with what we know and always looking at opportunities to get better and learn something new, I think as we've evolved in the past, we'll continue to evolve into new things. Right. Hopefully so, that answers what you were looking at. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So you feel as though it, could, it, it remains to be a viable and, and competitive model, you know, for the next five, 10 years? Yeah. I mean, especially in a city here, there's still plenty of firms that are offering it. Um, but I think the way we look at it and when Mike and I sit and really talk about what's next is we're always looking at what that next avenue trading wise to go down is. You know, five years ago, were we the exact same when we are now? No, it's definitely different than what we were even, you know, five years ago. And I think if we do a chat for traders in five years' time, um, I think seven points would have changed a lot probably from where it is right now, too. I think we'll constantly – we'll look to see what's what's pushing the market, what's driving the market, and then do it responsibly enough to where we're comfortable, but not also just following the herd. Mm, okay. Well, let's lock that in for five years from now. <laughs> Done. <laughs> cool. And Mike, I'm going to let you go and enjoy your evening. Um, if someone listening to this podcast would like to uh, find you online, probably the best place is Twitter and the website. Do you want to share those two things? Yeah, I, th I think my Twitter handle is just mmangieri, M-M-A-N-G-I-E-R-I -E 34. Um, and then seven points is seven points capital.com. Okay, great. And both those links will be in the show notes as per normal. Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time to do the podcast. Oh, it was great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Hopefully, this was hopefully good. nobody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.